So hi, um, my name is Joseph Wilk, and I'm going to be talking about some testing ideas, tools, and some languages outside of the Ruby world. So here I am sitting in a Ruby conference telling you that I'm not going to talk about Ruby at all, pretty much. So what am I going to do? Well, I kind of think um, communities sometimes have the tendency to be quite insular with their ideas. Um, kind of the Java community obviously has a very rich testing history. And, um, and I kind of want to try and kind of bring out some of the ideas in the other languages and bring it in. I feel like the Ruby community is kind of a very receptive audience for some of these ideas. So I'm kind of hoping to um, show you some stuff which may inspire you or may be useful outside of the Ruby world for you. So really, there's no Ruby tools and as long as we have, both have the expectations set, then I hope I won't disappoint you too much. So there's, um, there's a pattern from the book, um, I think it's the 97 things every programmer should know. And um, I wasn't um, studious enough to write down the name of the guy who I was talking to who said it. But um, he kind of said there's some evidence to suggest that the number of programming languages that you know, and when I say know, I mean you kind of understand the paradigms of that language and kind of you can very naturally, fluidly write in that language. It kind of has a correspondence with your programming skill. You pick up these different paradigms and you start to be able to apply them in different contexts, different languages. It's kind of a, a hard thing to say kind of concretely, but I think there could also be something about passion and that people that want to be kind of multi-polygots are the sort of person who really wants to be as best as they can in their skill. So I'm kind of hoping as well as kind of showing you some tools and stuff that this also applies to testing. If you have more paradigms in your head about the way you can test stuff, then I don't see why you can't be better testers or programmers. I kind of see the, them as the same thing. So <clears throat> the testing world is, um, when I first sat down to write this kind of presentation, I was fairly depressed. It was like JUnit, RSpec, PHP spec, JSpec, circumspec, something spec, something, 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 something. And just these tools to me aren't really that interesting. I mean, I, apart from Cucumber, of course, that's still <laughs> quite interesting. Sorry, I was like. Um, so what I really wanted to kind of move away from was these languages, it's useful to have some kind of BDD testing tool that works for people, but I'm, I just, to be honest, you can't be bothered to talk about them, so I'm not going to. I'm just gonna move on to what I think are some of the more interesting stuff. There's also whole kind of typing and how static types and how that affects mocking. And again, like, why, why tell you about something that's a lot more verbose? You know, we've already won there, like, what's the point? So nothing to do with typing or mocking. Again, that's just boring. So some of the stuff I do want to focus on, uh, property testing, model testing, they tend to have been, um, fairly academic in some ways, but quite commonly used tools in the functional world. Um, some of the things we can learn about test feedback and utilizing metrics from tests are graphical. Um, the fact that written tests sometimes aren't good enough and that we need some sort of visual representation. Uh, dealing with permutations and dealing with asynchronous stuff. And I figure probably that out of all this stuff, maybe the asynchronous stuff will be stuff you could take away and utilize in stuff like JavaScript, but the rest of the stuff may be a little bit out there. So. Please bear with me. So the first one I'm going to jump into is Haskell. So Haskell is a pure functional language. And I'm not going to try and condense the entire language into your head in about 30 seconds. So really, I want to kind of show you some of the testing tools that have evolved around Haskell. And specifically, I like this quote from a man who I can never pronounce his name, but I'm going to give it a try. Dijkstra? I'm not sure. How was that? Does anyone actually know how to pronounce that name? Dijkstra. Thank you. Almost. So he says that programming testing can be used to show that the present can be used to show the presence of bugs, but not the lack of bugs or the absence. So when I like to think about this, like a single aspect test, for example, with some static data, is a very good example about expressing the behavior of a system. But if we kind of move our minds into a more statistical world, that test doesn't give us a, a sufficient evidence to perhaps conclude that that function is bug-free. So Again, going very brutally to that statistician mind. Well, so if we increase the number of tests, if we were 
had you know, a million tests against this function, trying lots of different test data, lots of different logical properties, then he's right, we wouldn't be able to show the absence of bugs, but we could create sufficient evidence to maybe suggest that there aren't bugs. And I kind of think that's an interesting idea, which kind of brings us to the first tool I want to bring up, which is a quick check. Now, there are some implementations, um, kind of some rough stuff around with Ruby, Perl. It's kind of propagated to a whole bunch of languages. I think there is stuff you could use in Ruby, but I'd break my law if I told you about it. So, so there's this kind of crazy um, logic format. And I kind of found with a lot of these tools after um, kind of studying computing at uni and then not using any of it for six years and then coming back and going, oh, yeah, that was actually kind of useful. We can kind of define things about a function. So for all values of, of s, the length of the thing returned by this five random character function is five. It, it's a fairly trivial logical property of a function. And you can define it in the, um, in the logical sense if you really wanted to. So what QuickJet does is it takes this logical definition and it will generate random tests based on some data distribution. You can kind of customize specifically what type of data. So it's going to try and insert, you know, like strings, numbers, whatever it possibly is given as a range of stuff it can throw at this function. And then it's going to go and run thousands and thousands of tests against your function. And hopefully your function bursts into flames and melts. And you get spat out some counterexamples. Some, some examples where that function failed that logical property. We said for all possible um, S's that get taken by this function should have that property. So we can find like counterexamples, which is kind of cool. Excuse me. <clears throat> so this kind of stuff is already possible in, oh crap, I show you some Ruby, damn. Um, this stuff is kind of possible in tools like RSpec. And um, Elizabeth Hendrickson has a couple of really interesting blog posts about how she tried to take RSpec and make it more like, like more exhaustive data set testing stuff. So, you know, very trivially testing the, the reverse function works of Ruby, which you would never ever do. But. And then kind of doing something quite similar to the idea of quick check, you know, go run a thousand tests, randomly picking strings, like two characters, numbers, map them down to strings. It's, you know, it's a very naive implementation of how you could do something like quick check in Ruby. I want to show you the same thing in, Ruby, uh, in, in Haskell. So the top box represents the distribution of the data that's fed into this reverse function. Now, this is, again, where a lot of power comes from in quick check. And you can make this as simple as you want to as complex as you want. In this example, um, the arbitrary line, I'm specifying that it uses um, displayable characters in Haskell. And this co-arbitrary is actually how, it, how I define it randomizes picking those values. And this, this is like trivial. I'm, I'm still trying to get my head around like page long examples of how people generate this data sets. But Obviously, when you're throwing loads and loads of test, kind of test data at something, you want like a tight handle on what type of random distribution that has and whether the values are biased or not. The bottom line is, is a very simple property. Uh, we just do this prop underscore, which isn't that interesting. And just stating that uh, where XS is this character string, that the reverse of it should be equal to itself, a very simple property. Running quick check, we just tell it that function, and it goes off and just runs 100 tests which is kind of cool, considering we only wrote one. But they can be quite hard to formalize. And I think that's one of the barriers behind some of these tools is that actually you could spend quite a long time formalizing this logic. So I kind of think there's a, a balancing line of where you want to do that. So I said I wasn't going to talk too much about tools. But imagine something like Cucumber, where you have a table um, in Cucumber, which can represent the inputs to that test and then some output state. So there's no reason why you couldn't take something like quick check and start mutating those inputs to that cucumber test, for example, and examine what happens to the system when it gets all these weird and wondrous crazy data sets. It's just a brief idea. So jumping on to the next one I want to talk about. Oh, it doesn't stand up very well, does he? Um, Erlang, which is based on the ACT model and is very much focusing on messaging and concurrency. So this has a really badly named tool called Muck Erlang. That's, <laughs> uh, yeah, I seriously question that. Um, so Erlang, um, you can imagine, has, has lots of processes potentially communicating messages between each other. And it's fairly easy to kind of produce a quite complex set of protocols of kind of what are the different states the system could be in, what, what happens if this message comes for that message, and 
you can imagine you can build a fairly complex parallel, parallel system fairly quickly. So what this MOOC Erlang does is it says, OK, well, I'm going to, Erlang is compiled. Um, it's going to take out the communication concurrency and distribution aspects of Erlang and actually run it under a completely new runtime system, which simulates all process activity. So the, the idea is then from that, we can generate finite state machines and examine the possible states that a system could be in. This is a, a really simple example. You can imagine some kind of trivial message server where you have clients kind of logging into a service, trying to send a message to another client, the client logging in and getting that message back. So you can kind of see already here, you, very simply, you could extrapolate the various states that this system could be in of that one, you know, the first person logged in, the second person logged in, then the message, or they logged in the message, and you, you kind of get the idea. So this is where we get to do some scary stuff. Well, scary, it's not really that scary. Def so in model testing, the idea is we want to define some property of the system and it's going to go off and explore every possible state that that finite state machine could be in and assert this logical property holds. So this um, is simply stating that when someone sends a message, that person should receive it. But it has like a kind of a precondition, you know, um, the user one does not send a message until someone's logged in. And then, you know, the action, so if they send that message, and then the effect, eventually that person receives a message. So you could write this, and the bottom box actually represents what we write in this MOOC Erlang language, which is, I'm going to have to, Bucci Monitor, which is linear temporal logic. There's really crazy names, which I can't pronounce, so I'm probably getting that wrong. So we can represent that property of our system. Again, this kind of logical representation of, of some thing we want to always be true for that model. And then Erlang, I'm afraid, really doesn't make very good slide um, code. It's, it's a, just a mess, right? But OK, like, briefly. Did I get a funky laser pen? So the, the, in the middle part, you'll see that string that I just told you about, not P until Q implies, eventually P implies, eventually R, which map down to predicates below it, which are about sending messages, logging in, and receiving messages. So again, fairly ugly, but the ability to do this sort of stuff, if you've ever had any debug, sort of like this, this level of concurrent process and protocols going on, it, you know, you quickly discover that, in fact, this test fails because what can happen is that um, Clara could log in, Fred could log in, Clara could send the message, and then, Frog, and then Fred logs out before he ever receives the message. So already that identifies a, like a problem with this protocol. So here's the, well, good and bad news, I guess. Something called the pesticide paradox, which is from Visa from some software testing book. Uh, he states that, all these ideas are kind of really good ways of preventing or finding these bugs, but unfortunately, what you're left with is even more subtler, even harder bugs. And these tools ultimately become ineffective to capture those bugs since like, they've already missed them. So these tools can help, but it still doesn't rule out any sort of, you know, I, I still can't see how you can not have sort of some level of QA sort of manual or some human inspection of systems. It just gives us another tool to our kind of tool set. So closure, I'm really briefly going to dive into, um, mainly because this one isn't really about a tool as such. I just kind of found the language interesting. So Brian Marrick wrote a, um, a kind of a ah, BDD-esque um, uh, mocking testing framework called Midgy. And at the top there, I've got the closure version. At the bottom, I've got the Ruby version. <clears throat> and one of the things that Brian states is that in closure, everything, well, pretty much immutable. So it doesn't make any sense to use the word should or talk about it could be that or it might not be that. He kind of wants to build up facts about his function, and a system should be defined by a number of facts. Also, kind of this dot, dot, dot syntax is kind of like a mock saying it is this thing, we, we don't really care. And you'll notice, obviously, since we're talking about functions here and not the bottom example where we have classes or mocks. I find something um, very elegant about the top one in the fact that it's almost like it's not a test. It's almost like it's, it's much, much more of a specification. Alive in the next generation of cell, so this is from the game, Conway's Game of Life, like provided that a live cell goes to false and the neighbor count goes, no, neighbor count of the cell is three. So these are just globally defined methods or defined in a module, but they have no object to invoke against. And I just look at the bottom example, and it just suddenly feels quite crafty of like the responsibilities of this object. I'm stubbing. I'm not really defining like a fact. I'm just dealing with like preconditioned stuff that I need to do in order to get the assertion. So, just uh, an interesting syntax in his um, testing framework. 
Ioki um, is just an idea I want us to steal, and someone may have already stolen that I've missed it, but something Ioki does really nice, which was written by Ola Bin, um, I've been there, I think, Bin, uh, is the documentation um, for Ioki. He's kind of written a similar Aspecky style language. And um, what's really interesting about this is that we often say the specifications of the documentation, but then I've worked in a lot of open source projects where you say, okay, let, let's, let's just expose those to the users so they can go read them. And there's like a sudden like intake of breath and like, oh yeah, maybe that one's not quite right. Maybe that's a bit technical. What he's done is in his kind of RDoC style documentation of IOKI, he's exposed all the tests. So it should, like he's talking about dictionary equality and he's saying, you know, should return true for, the, for two empty dictionaries where one has a new cell. So I, I really like this idea of exposing the test through the documentation because I think it kind of stops them rotting and starts to make you think more about the language and care more about how you phrase these, which I think is always a great thing as, as documentation. So this one I'm, has a little bit more detail about because I kind of wanted to leave some maybe more practical-ish stuff and JavaScript's kind of fun to mess around with. So JavaScript has a interesting situation where often it's contained in this black box, the browser. And this black kind of embedded system almost is slow and painful. And the APIs to interact with it, while improving, are still, to me, fairly clunky and messy. So something I quite like the idea of. And there's lots of tools that enable you to kind of run like headless browsers and get away from this kind of built together clunky, slow system, like um, HTML units and V8, like that. But the kind of reason I brought up Zombie, or oh, Zombie.js, is I quite like the fact that it's a JavaScript implementation of the DOM um, used in JavaScript. It's kind of accepting that um, if you really want to kind of get that interactivity and have a nice API to it and keep it fast, why not just keep it all pure JavaScript? It has a very similar syntax to sort of things you'll have seen in um, Capybara or WebRat, you know, or Selenium, sort of visiting URLs, filling in buttons. I thought it deserved a mention because I think it's an interesting solution to bringing these things natively to the language. And I think still with Ruby, as far as, as far as I know, we're still mainly cutting out things like V8 or like through SpiderMonkey, through Johnson, backing out to C stuff, which well, are going to be fast. I kind of like the purity of this, that so I can just jump into the JavaScript and actually see how it works and not have to pass through lines and lines of C code. Vows is the other framework I wanted to mention. Vows is a Node.js um, testing framework. Um, and it demonstrates a couple of interesting things with kind of whole asynchronous stuff. One thing it does initially is it creates a separation between the data that's under test and the tests. So you have this topic at the top, which you know, is a function of value, just return something. This is executed once. And then each of these assertions is run against that topic. So that, that doesn't sound that interesting, but you can kind of see how powerful this can be with dealing with asynchronous stuff and dealing with running things in parallel. So when you have an asynchronous call, um, in my past um, hacking, often this is always like the hellish problem of having to do sleeping and waiting on conditions for things to be true. And you know, this comes built in with the asynchronous idea that you can take this file stat function, which is, runs in the background, I'm oh, sorry, asynchronously, and say that you should only run the tests using what we do in JavaScript callbacks. Only once this, once this function is finished, it should then fire that this.callback line, which will fire off all my tests. So it's a very clear, kind of clean way to deal with asynchronous functions. There's a lot of interesting stuff actually going in the source of vows. So if you get a chance, I'd recommend having a dig around. There's another fairly similar idea with these kind of promises or futures, where you define this proxy object where you def kind of are deferring the um, execution of, some, of, of an asynchronous thing. You don't have the data yet. So it's a similar way about creating, um, kind of not having to do any blocking or waiting, about being enabling your methods to be called when the callback fires off in this. And you can kind of guarantee it's going to either emit an error or a success. So this pattern is often used where you want to decouple the caller and the callee. And it kind of does the same thing as we saw in the previous example. But some people prefer it. So the most fun thing about this, and kind of start to wish that maybe RSpec and some other tools that had it built in from the start, was um, being able to fire these things off in parallel. So you have 
a kind of a closure right. You have a topic, and then you have a bunch of assertions. There is nothing stopping all three of those from firing at the same time. You could argue that there's maybe like shared resources or some sort of kind of global state that could get problematic, but to me that's the smell in your tests and not really a, an issue you should try and resolve to get this sort of independence and be able to take advantage of this parallel stuff. It seems so much more elegant than you know firing up a couple of processes which are just running through a list of specs to actually be able to just fire them all off at once. I think it's a really powerful thing in Vals and probably the thing I like most. So this is fairly um, old hat, but I just thought I'd mention it because I think it deals with the interesting problem of the permutation explosion. <clears throat> you may have um, heard I've talked about tools, previous talks like pairwise, where you can try and kind of reduce the number of combinations that you need to or in, in order to examine, in order to kind of cut down your test data set. Well, kind of the whole kind of jQuery idea or things like browser orientated is that they need to just it's, no good, it's not good enough to say, oh, we kind of, a little bit of us might work on Opera, like not point something, but we don't really know. So it kind of fires off against loads of different browsers. And the way it does that is by crowdsourcing the problem. So anyone can fire up um, a browser window and kind of give up that, that page for someone to use to run tests across. If you caught any of the lightning talks, um, James did a similar one, um, term, Terminus, right, James? It's a similar idea of where you kind of create open this tab, which can then be reappropriated by a test process and stuff thrown across it. This is kind of cool for the whole JavaScript world. Um, if you've ever come across a tool called um, Globus, that it kind of is used a lot in um, grid computing research that has a sort of similar idea where if a computer is idle for a certain amount of time, it will then start distributing um, kind of computations, usually fairly kind of heavy physics stuff they tend to use it for, to and then you can imagine like a lab full of computers, right, and the student goes away for like 10 minutes and immediately that machine kicks in and starts contributing resources. I'd really like to see something like that applied to other domains because not just kind of public cloud sourcing, but private sourcing and that we have lots of nodes in our work, in our workplaces that I'd really like to see more utilized for kind of the way we run our tests. This is kind of fun, I get to talk about Java at Ruby. My very, well, my first commercial programming language. Java has a lot of really exciting ideas, and I'm already trying to steal as many as possible. JUnit Max is a tool that Kent Beck wrote, and his whole, whole principle of this tool was that he wanted faster test feedback. He kind of defines two major principles that he did a lot of like metric research on testing and large test suites to see what sort of patterns he found. And being that failures are not randomly distributed, it tends to be the same problematic tests which fail, and you have lots of tests which never fail. And also in terms of the performance time for tests, it tends to be distributed as just a lot of really short ones and then a couple of very large tests. So his idea is something we're maybe a little bit common with, with something like auto-test uh, auto and growl sort of notifications in that when you're using Eclipse, it's a plugin for Eclipse, when you save your code, it will, it will kind of give you a notification immediately on the left there, kind of the notification and the bit down the bottom, telling you there's an error in your code. So, <clears throat> excuse me a second. And what he's doing here is he's using metrics about your test suite and what tests are most, what, what tests are most likely to fail based on probability distributions. So rather than going and running like the entire test suite, you're getting very rapid feedback we already have some of these ideas in um, Ruby with some of, some of the tools. But the idea of having it integrated into an IDE that's kind of giving you that snappy feedback that's immediately as you kind of finish your line, hit save, bang, you immediately get a notification that that test failed. You could then go see like how many times has that test failed. You've got like the little plugin at the top which tells you the overall state of the test suite. And you can kind of see it's a little small, but there's like a kind of a timeline with red, green, red, green, where you see the, the amount of time you were in the green for when you moved into the red and so on. This is a, a really cool tool, and I think something that would be really nice to see um, in the Ruby sort of IDs like Redcar. Industrial Logic uh, um, is a company who does kind of quite a lot of, I guess sort of, I'm not sure if it is just Java, I think they do .NET and Java as well, kind of training programs. And their um, angle is they're totally obsessed with metrics. So what I've got here, uh, is someone attempting to solve maybe a kata, some sort of problem. They're using something like Eclipse or IntelliJ. For a start, the events on this graph 
Uh, first, let's do like, you've got red and green, right? So like how long you were in the red for, how long did you spend with failing tests, and how long did it take for you to get that green? So immediately that's an interesting thing to see, right? You know, if I was in, excuse me, if I was in red for like 10 minutes and then was green for five seconds, immediately back into red, maybe I'm doing something wrong. And since we're using an IDE, we can capture a lot of the refactoring patterns because stuff like IntelliJ, you know, people just use that, I mean, the amount of refactoring um, patterns you can apply through editors like IntelliJ are amazing. So we've actually captured in this graph when you did the refactor. So we've literally got like the red green refactoring pattern as a metric. We can assess this and what they do is they kind of look at this and try and help people see where they can improve in their practices. Very much at a micro level, looking at like what happened over you know, 10 minutes, not looking over like what happened over a week or two. I think this is a really interesting tool and something that, again, I'm, I've been working on a side project, um, Limited Red, to try and kind of take this idea and Kent Beck's idea and do the same sort of thing. I don't know if um, also some of the CATA websites now will start to show you a little bit of this information about like how long we were in the red, how long we were in the green. So here's a collection of just really random stuff which didn't really fit anywhere but was kind of interesting. And some of these ideas aren't that new, actually, but I, I never knew about them, so I'm hoping you guys didn't either. So the, 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 the fundamental problem for me, and I mentioned this a little bit at the beginning, about tools like Cucumber, for example, is plain text just isn't good enough. You know, conversations we can get, but I need images. And most of the people who I've talked to who are involving non-tech people in doing things like Cucumber are doing like, you know, the sketching on the board and often like the cucumber is this, or the gherkin is the side effect of actually having gone away and scribbled cards, diagrams back and forth. So here's a kind of a couple of tools where people, um, specifically in the group which has a really painful acronym, something like the Agile Alliance T Functional Testing something, something, something. It's an awful acronym, but there are kind of a lot of smart people coming up with some ideas about I, things they can do with pictorial representations for how we look at tests. So Ward Cunningham, um, I think he, when, what year did he do this in? I think this example I got was from around 2007, so it's not exactly bleeding edge, but I was kind of fascinated to see it. Uh, I'm actually going to show you a brief um, demo so you can get a feel for what this tool is. So it's a, it's a list of tests. And what this is all about is what, running the test, but providing a better visualization of what happened during the test. It takes a little while because it's actually running stuff. So it has this um, swim lane idea of the different roles that are involved in running this test, the developer, developer two, candidates. And you can see that they were taking various actions and that this is time sensitive, so the various timelines of when these actions occurred. The really neat thing is as you roll over, you get little snapshots of parts of the UE, so you can identify where the bottom was. It's highlighted yellow there, they, they click nominate, they click search. This is a, a really nice way of getting a, some visual representation of what's going on inside a test. So we can look at the script that's behind this, which doesn't really look that exotic or interesting. It's kind of clicking thing, logging thing, fairly, fairly kind of standard sort of web esque API. What's quite nice is when we execute this, we can also get an, ex an exact layout of what happened. So I think if I click run now, yeah. So then you see what we just, the script parts and also the UE elements. And what's really nice with this example and something that Ward is very keen on was that you can still inspect these elements and see what was, the, what was the radio button, what was the select box. You're actually getting the elements in place from during the test run, which is a really powerful idea. And you know, I would love to see something like this for some of the higher level acceptance testing tools. And it's an area that we really are lacking in, in, in this sort of IDEs or tools to enable people to write these sort of acceptance tests. Another tool you may have um, come across, which is still fairly prototypey. Um, Brian Marek did a similar thing. Um, I think he's done it with OmniGraffle, and he did it with um, something else, where he um, was using fitness as the back end, which is, if you don't know, is kind of like a cucumber, but more table-centric. And he, in OmniGraffle, he created this sort of markup, and then he parses this diagram, which is just XML um, in OmniGraffle, and converted it to a test, which then gets executed. So his idea was that he could actually edit, like, you know, edit a little bit of this document, like change some of the text, 
and it would change the test. So again, this feeling that like we need we need the visual sometimes in order to communicate this stuff. If you know working with UX people, it's really beneficial to be able to show them screens and not just given I did this and I did that and I did this. He's, he's, I think there's actually a Ruby a Ruby gem that he has been playing around with. So if you go to Brian Marrick's blog, I'm sure you'll be able to dig out that and have a play for yourself. <clears throat> I'm doing for time. So it's kind of a an issue I have with um, testing that I wanted to briefly touch on is that I find that when it comes to kind of what we know about failure, there's kind of quite a divide often in what that a developer knows and what a tester knows. And I've got a link there, which I'm actually having a bit of trouble with. But um, Elizabeth Hendrickson, um, who I think this year, last year, won the PESC uh, Agile Award, has written a lot of amazing stuff about just kind of QA sort of like fail heuristics as well, things that you should look for when failing. And she's got this great cheat sheet of, you know, like when you're testing dates, when you're testing times, when you're testing like all these different types of data sets. She's kind of done the hard work and read, read the lots and lots of books about things that you should look for in failure. And I find there's often quite a disconnect with developers of, of really understanding what sort of things are likely to fail. So from a kind of just a developing perspective, if I know more likely things that are fail, I'm more, li I'm more likely to produce a higher quality software because I'm going to program for those in my head. I'm going to be aware of those cases. And I often see kind of teams where they'll have a developer who will throw it over to some testing process when they'll get a bug back and they'll fix the bug with a little test so it never happens again. And there's not really any kind of a, an acceptance that developers should know those heuristics. What's, what's interesting, uh, kind of aside from the manual heuristics, is there's a lot of testing tools which using metric information, um, I think it was, um, there's a tool called Agitar, which I didn't put on the slides because it looks like an evil enterprise solution and doesn't really sum up what it achieves in its web page, which automatically generates um, JUnit tests based on metrics from analyzing your test suite and other people's test suites, which is kind of evil in some ways in that their argument is that writing unit tests is slow, so why don't you automate it? Which is a fairly scary idea, but there's definitely something quite nice about the idea of a suggestive element to that, of um, suggesting heuristics that maybe you want to investigate about various parts of the code base. So I think there's a lot of value we can take from manually learning heuristics of failure and also looking potentially at tools that may be suggestive of areas of our code base, areas where tests are failing all the time sort of thing, a lot of metric information that could guide us towards heuristics. So, um, I think Ben yesterday did a, a, really, um, a really good talk about stealing ideas and how we've stolen ideas like rack. And um, it kind of made me feel fairly guilty because um, I guess my message takeaway from this would be please go steal those ideas and write the tools for me so I can use them. <laughs> so I, I think there's a lot of interesting ideas and I've, I've kind of seen um, I think a bunch of Py a Python team um, use a lot of the quick check stuff in order to you know, really dig out some interesting bugs in their system. So I kind of hope that there's some interesting stuff there and some hopefully stuff that you can go away with and start to play around in your own languages. So I hope I've satisfied a little bit of your curiosity in some of the tools that are outside um, the Ruby testing world. So thanks very much. <laughs>